Everyone, welcome back to the Market Chat. My name is Richard Moglin. Joining me today is a very special guest, Mark Minervini. Mark is a veteran trader with over 35 years of experience on Wall Street, and over his career, he has yielded incredible performance, including a five and a half year period where he averaged a 220 percent annual return with only one losing quarter. He's also the author of many of my favorite trading books, including Trade Like a Stock Market Wizard, Think and Trade Like a Champion, and Mindset Secrets for Winning, as well as being featured in Market Wizards by Jack Schwager. Finally, he is the U.S. Investing Champion of 1997 and currently leads the 2021 Money Manager Division with a gain of 111% in just three months. Mark, thanks so much for being here. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks. It's a, we, we finally got together. <laughs> yeah, it, it's great to have you on. Um, and to start things off, uh, I think I'd like to focus on mindset and kind of the, the steps you've taken to become the trader you are today. So um, you said in, in previous videos that took you about six years before you're pro- profitable. Uh, what were some kind of aha moments that really changed things for you and your trading? Well, I mean, I had a lot of aha moments every time I blew myself up and had big problems in the market, which were many, you know, in the beginning, because I had no idea what I was doing. I had no mentorship. I had uh, very little money. It was a very challenging environment for me. Um, so uh, what aha moment was reading How to Trade in Stocks by Jesse Livermore. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's one of my favorite books that sort of crystallized everything for me. I really, that that little book uh, was, was a big, uh, was a big turning point for me. Um, when I had some years of experience and then read that book and was able to realize that what I was doing, um, in real time in a modern day timeframe was exactly what, uh, Jesse Livermore was doing back in the twenties and thirties. And it really gave me a belief that what I was doing was timeless and to take personal responsibility. And that I knew if I just put in the time and got the expertise and the skill that eventually it would pay off. Absolutely. And that transitions. Well, I was going to ask you, what's, what are some books, uh, historical traders that you've studied or other resources that really uh, forged the the trader you are today and and helped you develop your own style? Well, uh, you probably, people have heard me say this many times, but I have over 4,000 books in my library and I've read pretty much every one of them, but I would say that there's a handful that I've read, you know, 40, 50 times each. So what I did early on was I found some books that I, you know, really thought were important and read them over and over and over and over until I really internalized the information. That's what I would suggest somebody do with my books, you know, read them because my books are really a distilled version of a lot of previous, a lot of previous works. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm sure there'll be, you know, even more distilled down the road with other people who write books. So I would rather, you know, recommend that somebody reads 10 great books 50 times each than 500 books, because, you know, first of all, there's not that many, there's not that many great books. And on top of it, you know, if you're reading 500 books, you're reading probably, you know, four or 500 different styles. And you really want to hone in on a particular style and perfect it, uh, pick that style, and then uh, really, really perfect the, uh, the techniques by internalizing whatever, you know, that, that style uh, needs. Absolutely. And, and anyone who has read your books realizes that establishing discipline and following rules um, very strictly is a central theme of yours. Um, how important are these things to achieving super performance? Well, it's the most important, you know, without rules and without emotional discipline, it doesn't matter if you have the best strategy in the whole world, if you don't right. follow it. And most people don't follow a strategy, even if, you know, even uh, many, you know, we've had thousands of people that have learned from me over the years coming to my seminars and hundreds of thousands, if not more, that have read my books, of course. But, uh, you know, how many of those people actually follow and, and, and are disciplined, a small percentage, but it's, any, right. it's no different than how, what percentage are great athletes or great doctors or great trial attorneys. You know, it, it's the same in any profession. So uh, the discipline is the most important. As a matter of fact, I, th- I was speaking with uh, a good friend of mine from Canada the other day, and he said to me, he said, I, I have to say, he said, I, I think you're the most disciplined person I, I, I know in, in, in my whole life. I don't think I've ever met anybody that's more disciplined. Um, I would say Mark Ritchie, you know, uh, yeah. our own Mark Ritchie is, he's one that's right up there with me. I'd have to say, you know, if there's anybody that I've seen that's, you know, as disciplined as I am, he'd be probably the next one that I know. Very cool. And, um, and, and perfect. Let, let's, let's pivot now to your training strategy and routines. Well, actually, before I want to get to that, um, You talk a lot about priorities and mindset circuits for winning. How should new traders who want to achieve super performance structure their goals and also their priorities? 
Oh, look, if you, when you look at your life, you know, I've, uh, I've been around for 56 years now, and I look back and I might not have realized this when I was 20, but at 56, I realized that all the things that I have and the things that I've accomplished are the things that I put at the top of my list for priorities. Mm-hmm. Um, and my priorities are different now than they were 20, 25, you know, 30 years ago. Uh, my priorities are more family oriented now, my wife and my, my daughter and uh, my health, you know, uh, but if you were to ask me what my, my priorities were, you know, when I was 25 or 30, it would have been money and success and right. stock trading was, you know, absolutely the, the top of being the best trader that I can be. And so, you know, you're going to, what your life is going to end up going right where, you know, as Ed Sakota said, everybody gets what they want out of the market. Well, that that's, that's what I'm talking about with priorities. What you prioritize is exactly what you're going to get. Your, your, your life's results really will come in, right in the order of your priorities. So, you know, if you want to be a great trader, it's got to be at the top of your list. You know, it, you don't get a, a gold medal at the Olympics by being a part-time, uh, you know, Olympic athlete uh, without having it be your utmost biggest goal and the, and the thing that you're striving for every day and pretty much, you know, gets put above everything for that particular uh, time period while you're, while you're, uh, you know, uh, uh, training for the gold medal. So the same thing with business and anything. Makes sense. And uh, getting into your training, training strategy, a big part of that is the volatility contraction pattern. You're, you're known for the VCP. Um, yeah. But a lot of people, I think, just see it as a chart pattern. Could you explain what's actually going on behind the, the scenes when it comes to supply and demand uh, right. that creates that pattern. It's not just something to memorize. It's something to interpret on the chart. Yeah, it's something to understand. And right. I never you know, dreamed that this VCP was going to take off like it has. It really has become a vernacular in itself. Right. Um, and, and I'm really happy for that because when I, the reason why I developed it was when I started teaching others and, and I was having a hard time explaining what they needed to look for. And I was finding that a lot of people were looking at the, the O'Neill work and looking for cup with handle patterns. And then of course I developed these cheat areas that are mm-hmm. sort of like cup with handles with a low handle. Um, and to explain them, I drew this VCP and showed how the tightening in price action would develop. So the VCP is really a characteristic right. of pattern. Um, I use it in virtually every trade that I make. Uh, it has, they have VCP characteristics. Um, so it's, the, it's not the cause, it's the effect. That's right. what people have to understand. Even any chart pattern, people think because you know, everybody's looking at the cup with handle or everybody's looking at whatever, a wedge or you know, whatever some of these names are. Uh, I use my own vernacular now. I don't even know the, the, the terms of like some of the standard patterns. Uh, somebody asked me about a triangle the other day. I don't even know what a triangle is. I guess it represents a triangle. Uh, so, uh, you know, you, you have to realize that it's not because the chart is forming that it works. It that's the supply and demand that's forming it, that, and it, that's going to be there under any circumstances in an auction marketplace. So, that tightening in price from left to right. And when you get on the very right side of the chart and it gets very tight and the volume comes down, what it's telling you is that supply has stopped coming to market. And by looking at the chart and seeing where the overhead supply is to the left by the depth of the base and the length of the base and how tight it is on the right side and the volume, which it's not as easy as just as I'm you know, pointing it out right now, there's, there's a lot of nuances. But if you get it right, you get a pretty good idea of when there's no supply in the stock and that makes the stock vulnerable to move very sharply because supply and demand if there's no supply and you have demand and you've done your homework and there's institutions that have an appetite for that stock well then from that very point it can move fast and that's why you see a lot of these stocks they'll explode coming out of these tight areas and that that's the same if you went back to 1918 you'd see the exact same price action and we've looked at charts to, into the 1800s. Mm-hmm. Absolutely nothing has changed. The same exact things happening today as happened then. And the same thing will be happening 100 years from now. Perfect. And before we get a little bit more into the technicals, um, I wanted to ask you, because I think this is a big part of actually becoming a professional trader and taking responsibility. Um, could you walk us through your daily routine and how you set yourself up for success um, during the trading day, including getting your mind right, as well as organizing your the, the stocks you own, the stocks in your focus list, as well as your ready list. 
Well, after 37 years of doing this, I got it down pretty, pretty much now. So it's, right. it's not super exciting or super complex. It's done very quickly. You know, when I get up in the morning, I usually spend uh, five or 10 minutes just laying, staying still and going through, I do breathing exercises. And while I'm breathing, um, I, I go through my day, my routine. I check the market. I usually turn the TV on. I see if it's, you know, if the market's blowing up or if it's, you know, maybe, maybe it's going to be down huge or it's going to mm -hmm. be up big. And if there's a, you know, if it's, let's just say it's going to be down huge. So I immediately start going through, okay, my process for, you know, probably going to have some stocks that are going to be gapped down. How am I going to handle them? What if, you know, I have something that is, you know, moves down really big on me. I just start going through sort of the, day of what potentiality, you know, what can happen and how I'm going to deal with it and just sort of visualize, you know, dealing with that day. Um, then I get up and I, and, and I go, and now all my work is done the night before. So any stock work, you know, when I go to sit down at my desk, all, all the positions that I'm looking to buy uh, or, or maybe stocks that I want to sell into strength or, or that are profits. I've already figured that all out the night before. So now it's just a matter of executing. I go see if, you know, those stocks uh, cooperate properly, if they move to the pivot points. Uh, but uh, I, I've done all that work. So now I just go check my, uh, uh, check my watch list, organize everything. And I'm ready to go because like I said, it, all that work has been done uh, before the open. And what does your weekly routine look like? How do you search for ideas and VZPs? Um, I, I guess, and also do you take into account the fundamentals as well as the technicals beforehand? And what are some non-negotiable criteria? I know you have the, the, the trend template uh, that mm -hmm. you talk about in your books. Uh, could you talk a little bit about all of that? Okay. So that's a bunch of things. So, um, the, my, on the weekend, I do my biggest work. I run a lot right. of screens and I do a lot of work on the weekend. Um, so I work both on Saturday and Sunday, um, usually one day heavier than the other, depending, um, and, you know, during the week, I'm still searching each day, intraday. Um, it, and it depends if I have a whole bunch of names that, you know, came up on the weekend work, then I might not search as hard during the week. If it's something that's really sparse, then I might, if there's really not many ideas, then, and then I real I know there's not much to look for. So that, that will ebb and flow. Um, but as far as, you know, non-negotiables, you're going to want the stocks in an uptrend. And the reason why, and you talked about the trend template in MarketSmith, they have, it'll say Minervini. There's a section that has my trend templates, three trend templates, the Minervini trend templates. The reason why you want to be in that uptrend is because when you go back and you look at the biggest winning stocks, the stocks that made the big moves, 98% of them were in stage two uptrends. 98% right. of them met my criteria in the trend template. So if you're going to find a big winner, you know, you want to be in the 98% club, not the 2% club, right? You want a 98% chance. So if you're, if you're operating in a downtrend, well, then there's a, based on history, you've got a 2% probability of being in a big winner, but people want to buy it before it moves up. And they think they, that that's necessary, but it's really not because before the stock makes a big move, it's in an uptrend. Absolutely. And, and uh, in terms of fundamentals, I guess uh, we'll point people to your book because you talk about that a lot. Um, but uh, could you give some tips for people um, who are looking for those VCPs and, and they're going through the charts? You obviously have developed your eyes, so you can quickly, probably within seconds, um, go through a bunch of stocks and, and see it. But what are some tips for people to find VCPs if, if they're newer to this? The tips are to, you know, you have a lot of examples in my books. Mm -hmm. So you go to the books and you take a look at those examples and then look for stocks that look like that and then build your own, build your own model books, you know, look for stocks, find the stocks that have those patterns. And then, you know, the ones that worked out, the ones that didn't work out, you make, you make uh, copies of those. You maybe put them in two separate uh, piles and you start analyzing them and taking a look at what works and what doesn't work. Uh, but you, you start off with some good, you know, some good precedents of winners that came from low risk entry points uh, for, you know, maybe uh, uh, O'Neill's book, I believe used weekly charts. So that might be for a little bit longer term investors, but to get really specific and pinpoint, my book has a lot of uh, charts there from the daily perspective. And then of course, if you've gone to, you know, uh, my workshop, you have a workbook and that's where you've got there's uh, four or 500 pages there and hundreds of examples. So you've got those precedents and, and, and that's the, that's the starting point. That's where I started. I started with you know, looking at the, the best winning names and then seeing uh, uh, backing into current names that, uh, you know, that, that look like those names. I know you asked about fundamentals before. Fundamentals, 
are, I'm always looking for the fundamentals, mm -hmm. I, but I'll never invest in a stock just because of fundamentals. Right. It has to have the technicals. Right. So it has great earnings, great sales, great margins, great story. You know, fundamentals are great, great management, uh, return on equity, but the stock's in a downtrend. I'm not buying it. So, but on the other hand, stocks in an uptrend has no fundamentals, you know, or when I say fundamentals, reported fundamentals, right? Maybe they're showing losses, right? No sales losses, mm -hmm. but it's a biotech company. Well, 75, 80% of biotechs don't have earnings. So that's not a situation that you would ignore. Now you're going to be trading off the chart. You're looking for very high relative strength, high alpha names. You're looking for, you're looking at the, the FDA approval process, things like that. So you have to know the category that the company's in, and then you know what fundamental driver to look for. And again, in my first book, there's, a, there's no fundamentals in my second book. My first book has a pretty big section on fundamentals. Perfect. And, and in terms of, uh, fundamentals a little bit. Do you also look for group moves? So if a stock is setting up with the BCP, does it add to your conviction that multiple other stocks within that sector or industry group are also showing signs of accumulation accumulation, and, and are in stage two uptrends? Yes and no. So, and I'll tell you why. So first of all, you're in a, you're in a bear market and you start turning up off the lows. Right. And you're looking for group action, right? You're trying to get some confirmation. Well, sometimes you'll get the very cream of the crop uh, will, will set up and take off. Mm -hmm. and, they'll, and that's why they're called leaders. They'll lead. And by the time you get to the group and you see that the group's doing well, the best stocks are long gone. And this is what happened to me in the 80s and somewhat in the early 90s when I first started getting this down. I was looking at the market saying, okay, wait till we get the follow through day, look for you know, good action in the market, then look for the groups and then look for the best stocks in the group. I was always missing the leaders. I very seldom had leaders. I was buying laggards all the time. The leaders were extended. Either I, either I was buying extended leaders or I was buying laggards. So I said, why am I keep missing these stocks? How come I don't see them? So then I flipped it completely around and I said, I'm going to go stocks group market mm -hmm. and let the stocks lead me to the groups. And when stocks are acting well and we're seeing groups working, we know it's a healthy market. And that's when I started grabbing all the leaders and had that, that big run that you talked about, that five-year run was based on completely flipping the script. And, and during that correction, are you running any specific screens or are you just looking at every stock that passes through your trend template? Well, the trend template is just a qualifier. That's yeah. just a first criteria. So that's not the, all the criteria, uh, but that's, that's, a, that's what I call a qualifier, non-negotiable criteria. It has right. to meet that criteria. Um, so, you know, I'm looking for stocks. Now, it depends. Again, if let's say we're starting a new, you know, we have a bear market, starting a new bull market. Well, then I'm going to look for the highest relative strength name, stocks near new highs, uh, stocks that have held up the most, stocks that have rebound the fastest, those type of names. Now, let's say we were in late stage in a market and we've been in a bull market for a couple of years and we have a six week correction. Well, in that case, I might run a six week relative strength and see what held up the best during that six weeks. That's what I call a utility screen. Mm -hmm. So you have certain, you know, it, you got to think of it sort of like, uh, you know, you're a builder or a carpenter, right? You've got a screwdriver, a hammer, drill. You've got different tools. You got to know when to apply those. You're still building a house. You're still a, a carpenter, but you have different tools and tactics for different parts of the job. Perfect. I, I think that's well said. And um, getting actually down to the buy point, let, let's talk about the, the actual pivot point. Um, could, could you define that and uh, talk about what you're looking for in the moment, right before you're about to buy, as the stock is passing through that pivot point. All right. So pivot points come in a lot of different shapes and forms. They could be off of, you know, very large patterns, small patterns. They could be coming off of uh, the low of a base up the right side, off of what I call a cheat area or a low cheat. They could be coming off of a handle. It could be a pullback buy. There's a lot of different ways, but a pivot is a, an actionable point where it moves through it moves through a level and that level signifies that that's the area that it's cleared for you to then start buying. Um, the key is, is that you're trading from a perspective that you know what to expect. That's the whole key. The whole reason why you know, I've dedicated myself to one strategy and one way for 37 years, I'm doing the same thing that I started. I just, I do it better. You know, I've, I've perfected it over the years and my skills gotten better, but because I want to be a master at something. So I know every 
every eventuality, everything to expect, because that's really the key is knowing when things are acting normal or abnormal, because there are no absolutes. So I have a certain, certain reference points that I'm looking for. And from those levels, I know this is not acting right. This is exactly what it's supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. So those pivot points have to be taken, you know, into consideration, but you know, Jesse Livermore used pivot points a little bit differently than I would use a pivot point coming out of a chart. Back then he was plotting things and plotting price and, you know, very interesting. You know, you should study Livermore because he's definitely one of the greatest of all time and and just really the pioneer. Of, uh, of pivot points for sure. Um, so yeah, and then O'Neill, of course, you know his work is you know is phenomenal with uh, you know with moving through uh, buy points and pivot points based on uh, precisely what I'm talking about. You know I've taken it and I, I think uh, who was it? Um, I'm trying to remember. Uh, oh, from Stockby. Um, pretty pretty blonde. Pretty blonde. Yeah, yeah. Said to, said to me one time we were at a seminar and he said. Uh, this is surgical, you know, you've taken this right. to a surgical level. Um, and, and it's true, you know, I, I've taken it to a point where it's really, and David Ryan made a similar comment where, you know, this is really sort of like taking, uh, you know, the previous works and and refining them down to really precise, really precise uh, buying. And, and I think, you know, you young guys, you know, you're, you're getting it where you're getting more, it's so precise, you know, you're, you're studying my work and, and you're putting it all together and it's just getting more and more and with the, with the speed and with where able to have the, 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 the tools that we have now, it's just getting more and more precise and fast. Um, so, and it could, you know, these pivots can be used on intraday charts too. Right. You know, it, it doesn't, it, it, it can be used on intraday charts, weekly, daily, uh, doesn't know any time frame. These are timeless principles. Absolutely. It's, it's supply and demand in its purest form. Um, so speaking of intraday charts, when you're actually really pinpointing in on that pivot point, are you looking only at the daily um, or are you looking intraday? And also, what are you looking for in terms of volume coming in at that point? Well, I'm always looking for, I'm always, I, I'm, I'm using a daily. To, to, yep. That's the main chart that I'm screening on. Once I see something I like on the daily, I immediately look at the weekly and I'm always looking for the weekly too. And it would take some time to really talk about, you know, what I'm looking on both and, and uh, uh, but both are valuable. And then when I'm buying, I'm not looking at the intraday chart. I'm looking at the daily chart. I'm buying off the daily. The only time I'm looking at the intraday is if I'm buying a pullback. Sometimes if I'm buying a pullback and I want to wait until it turns back up because I'm very seldom ever buying on the way down. Even if it's a pullback, I'm waiting for it to turn up. I might look at a five minute and see if it's stabilized and maybe it made a little intraday pattern. It's starting to turn up from that. Very rare, but uh, so but 99% of the time I'm relying on the daily chart. Makes sense. Mm-hmm. And in, in terms of that initial stop loss point, um, where does that usually line up? The low of the day, the low of the week, um, or does it depend on the technical chart pattern? It depends on a, on, a, on a handful of things. You know, the low of the day is very obvious, you know, and, and these are very yeah. obvious levels. So you have to be careful about putting them at such obvious levels. But there are times where obvious levels are, are you should use. Uh, when things are really working well, you should use obvious levels because they're not going to take them out very often and they should hold when you're in a whipsaw market and you're going and it's, and things are moving all over the place. Uh, you can get, you know, the undercut these very, you know, the 50 day, the 20 day, you know, the recent low, the days low, the low in the pivot, the low in the base, they become levels that, you know, uh, uh, it seems like the, you know, the price seeks those levels it hunts them out and, and knocks everybody out, you know, creates those shakeouts. So uh, it, it's, it, it sort of depends on the environment. The main thing is, the math behind it you know you you don't want to think about it as much as where's the stop level to the chart you want to think about where's the stop level on the chart or whatever the stop level is what is that what is that math if you're if that stop on the chart is that is 15 percent away from your buy point and your average gain is 10 percent well and you're and you're right usually 50 percent of the time well that's a losing proposition so rule number one you always want to be getting odds on your money you always want to get odds on your money Absolutely. And, and how many names do you usually hold at once and how do you determine your initial position sizing? And, and also um, do you enter all at once or will you add to a position um, if that applies? Well, there is no set, you know, in stone formula, except there are some general guidelines, you know, I'm Mm -hmm. usually not taking a position. I I might take a, a very light position just to keep my finger on the pulse and, you know, I'll buy a token 
amount of shares when things are really not working or I want just getting in the market. But generally speaking, you know, a five or 10% position would be a small, you know, would be a starter position would be on the smaller side. A large position would be, you know, 25%. Although right now trading with this U S investing championship, you know, like I've said a few times before, you know, you got to trade like an animal because everybody else is trading like an animal. Um, And, you know, it's like, in sports, you know, the other guys are taking steroids. So you have to take steroids. So, you know, I'm, I, I'm going full, you know, full margin using, uh, you know, leverage with the, uh, uh, you know, with my trading right now. So a lot of big positions, a lot of short-term trading around positions. Um, but generally speaking, um, uh, and, and going back to, let's say, you know, some of the periods where I made my biggest returns, uh, 25% position sizes, anywhere between five or 10% on the, on the low side, trying to shoot for an optimal four to eight stocks fully margined, no more than 10 or 12. Makes sense. And um, after you have a position set and you've got some profit, uh, when do you decide when to, to, to take some off the table? Um, and how do you balance locking in gains while also letting winners trend? What was the first part? Um, when, when do you take profits if you've already got a gain? So again, it depends. Like right in, in the recent, this recent little run we've had pretty much all year, but uh, definitely for you know a couple, maybe six, eight weeks of this first three months of the year or so, breakouts just stopped following through. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You've probably, you've seen that where- I've had happen. <laughs> so many bases set up. There's all these big, you know, these bases setting up and everything was breaking out but you'd get one to three days. So I made an adjustment real quick. I said, I'm going to take one or three days and I'm going to just, you know, I'm going to pound this with, you know, with big positions and short-term trade. It's worked out great. Uh, that's not something that I always do. Um, so, but let's just say everything was working and, you know, stocks are coming out and they're, and they're ripping higher and they're following through and you find that you sell that stock in a couple of days and you're, you know, you're sitting there going, Poof, boy, I wish I didn't sell that stock. It's now 20%. Well, you know, you've got to change your tactic. You know, you've got to adjust to that. You don't have to, but look, here's the thing. It doesn't matter what happens to the stock after you sell it. If you were to, if you were to take 5% risk and sell every single stock at, at a 10% gain, and you're able to do that 50% of the time for each and do it, I don't know, a couple hundred times a year, you're a very rich man in a short period of time. Okay, does it matter if the stock and doubles from there where you sold it for 10%? If you can roll into another one and do it again and again and again and again. So, you know, think of it as flipping a coin. If I told you I'm gonna give you $2 for heads, you lose a dollar on tails and you can flip that coin, you wanna flip it as many times as possible, right? Right. So if you could flip it and your, your goal was to say, Hey, I want to get to, you know, X number of, I want to make X amount of money by, by this amount of time. Well, you would have to just say, okay, in that amount of time, I've got to flip this coin this many times because I'm going to make a net dollar every two times I flip it. Right. So that's sort of the thinking it, it's, it's, is there an optimal place to sell? Yeah. If you have a crystal ball and in hindsight, but no, there's really not. And I sell stocks all the time at 10% gains and they go up 50, hundred percent. I bought Cisco off of the new issue. I took five points and it went up 70,000% after that. You know, I traded Home Depot for a 30, 30% move in the nineties. It went up 40,000%, you know? So, but I made 36,000% in that same time period trading. Right. So it really depends on how you want to skin the cat, you know? So I sell when, I think the risk outweighs the reward. Mm -hmm. And here's a, here's a key. I'll give you a, a sort of a key tip. When do you sell into strength versus sell into weakness? When do you backstop versus sell right into the strength? Well, if your profits are 10% and your, your losses, let's say are five, you can't wait until the stock stops you out on the downside, because if it goes up 10, 12%, by the time you get a, a reversal or whatever you're you know, looking for to stop you out. You've given back most of the gain. You're probably only up five or 6%. So there's no profit. Now, if you're up 50%, you're up a hundred percent and you took a 5% risk. Okay. You maybe use the 50 day, a weekly close below the 50 day, or you can backstop it, trail it and, and really give it some room because you've got a big move now. So it, see, it depends. Now, if I'm on a, on a shorter term move, you know, I'm just getting out when the getting's good. I'm not waiting for that stock to break and coming in on me because then I'm going to give back all my profit. Absolutely. And, and uh, I think that's a great, great point. Um, 
getting into risk management, which, which we were just talking about a little bit, I think is really the most important thing. Um, you posted a great tweet um, last year showing after the September correction, how you progressively increased positions. You had snap early on, you, you, you added more the next day, the more, more the next day. And as the market turned, you kept adding more stocks. Uh, mm-hmm. Could you talk a little bit about progressive exposure and how do you put it into practice, for instance, coming out of this most recent correction? There's so many ways. I, I use progressive exposure intraday. I use it daily. So in, in just this last week, I, I, I went over that with the way that I trade it throughout the day, just how I trade it throughout the day and use progressive exposure. Um, so I'm always thinking progressively exposing and, and, and decreasing my positions based on the, the traction that I'm getting. So a very simple you know, way to explain it is, so you buy one or two stocks, all right? Mm-hmm. And maybe they're five or 10% positions, okay? Those stocks start working out. Maybe they're up seven, 8% each. Okay, you can buy another one or two. You got a little bit of profit. Maybe you sell one of them, and you nail down a 10% profit. Well, if you, if you, have, you have one stock goes up 10%, you sell it and your stops are 5%, you just finance two more trades. You could buy, you can now buy two stocks and use a 5% stop on each. And if you get stopped out, you're gonna break even because you're financing using that gain to finance and now you're, you're levering up. So, and now let's just say you get a few more winners. So now you've even banked more money and you can get a little more aggressive. This is the exact opposite of what people do. You know, usually mm-hmm. they'll sell and then they get nervous that, you know, things are going to turn around on them. And then when they go, when the stocks go down and they're at losses, they start doubling up and they start progressively exposing by averaging. And that's how they get themselves into a lot of trouble. So, and just the opposite, when things are, let's say those few stocks go against you. So now you would cut your position sizing down and then and keep progressively bringing it down until you're trading, you know, negligibly, or, you know, you'd be in cash. If you're, if you're, you haven't seen a profit in your last four or five trades at 20, 25% exposure, you shouldn't be going to 50% exposure. You shouldn't be going to 75 or hundred. You should be going to 10 to five to zero, you know, is, and, and bending with the market. So th- I think progressive exposure is probably one of the, the most important tactics that you can utilize to protect yourself and to keep yourself from having big drawdowns and also to keep yourself where you're, where you're invested in bull markets because you're, you're, you're exposing up. See, see the key is, is that you want to, you want to have a system that guarantees that you're trading your largest when you're trading your best and you're trading the smallest when you're trading your worst. So by, by progressively exposing and, and, and increasing your size when things are going well, you're going to be heavily invested in a, in a good bull market. And by bringing it down, you're going to be lightly invested when you go into a bear market. Makes sense. And um, are there any things you look at in terms of the market, whether it's an extension from a moving average, the, the breadth of the market, that when we're getting a little bit long in the tooth in, in a rally, we're, 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 all, we're already up 30% in a, in a few weeks, um, that might tell you to, to scale back a little bit um, to prevent maybe a, a big drawdown uh, when, when the market really reverses hard. Well, you're talking about like market indicators or stock, so things in individual stocks? Market indicators. So maybe a, a, the market getting 15% above a moving yeah. average, something like that. No, no, because that can go on for a long, long time. You know, I'm looking, I look at sentiment, you know, when everybody's bullish, then, you know, my antennas go up and I start looking for very specific sell signals in the individual stocks. But the main thing, momentum trumps sentiment. You can, I mean, you can have a lot of bullish sentiment and keep going for an extended period of time. So ultimately it comes down to the individual stocks. I'm really letting the stocks dictate. And it's going to show up in the stocks. If the market is in trouble, the stocks are going to roll over. They're going to stop me out. They're going to, if this, if the market's really running up too fast, you're going to have all the stocks are going to be extended and I'm going to be selling into strength. And yeah, it's going to all show up in the stocks. And sometimes it shows up in the stocks you know, well before the market gets into trouble, or even you'll see a bunch of stocks set up before the market bottoms in a bear market, and it'll give you a lead time. I found the best indicator for me are the individual stocks, but I guess you have to know what you're looking at and know how to read right. them. Right. All right. So Mark, uh, why don't we take a look at some charts and, and see how you analyze price and volume action, and, and we'll look at some that, that worked and, and some that ultimately stopped you out of a loss. Yeah. Okay. So NMM, 
bought it right here, coming out. And then see, it comes in a few days and then got knocked out. And this is one that, you know, if this maybe tightened up right here, this might've been what I call a failure. It was a failure reset, but just wasn't crisp enough for me. And it kind of wedged up. It got away from me. I was looking to maybe buy it back, but I did not. And bang, comes out. Now it's just put in another base and it's coming out of this. It came out on Thursday at a reversal. Now you got a little reversal recovery on Friday. So it's still moving along here. I don't know what's this up here. So since I, yeah, so this is up almost 70% from that first buy point. So unfortunately, mm -hmm. yeah. So again, this is, you know, how they normally look. It's usually within a few days to a few weeks that I'm knocked out at a loss. It's pretty right. quick. And, you know, that's an important thing to, to, to talk about or important thing to understand is that you want to be knocked out fast. Now, you know, people get frustrated. They buy the stock and boom, it turns around and they're out right away. That's exactly what you want. You want to know right away if you're wrong. So now you can move to something else and you're not wasting time. You know, if I sat in this stock for six months and it, it didn't go anywhere and then stopped me out, why well, just wasted six months of, of time to invest? So that's one of the reasons why you want to time your trades as best as possible and know if you're right immediately know I'm right or I'm wrong and engage along the way, you know, if things are acting normal or not. So you can, you know, if it's not acting right and it's not making you money, you move on. You know, the only good stock is a stock that's going up. Absolutely. And, and here um, talking about the failure reset, uh, maybe you're looking at other names, but do you know specifically why you didn't re-enter this? Um, it had some nice support, support moves off the lows there on those two bars. Yeah. I mean, you know, when we get volatile like this and, and, and the, you know, I call it the megaphone effect when you do this here, right. You know, and instead of being tight, you start widening, you know, that is the exact opposite of what I'm looking for. So that volatility, I have, to, I'm very careful to, you know, start getting back, you know, getting into a stock when it's volatile, that's where you really get whipped around. So yeah, that's, you know, the main reason if, like I said, maybe if this set up really crisp around the old high here, I, I can't really tell you what I was thinking at the time. You yeah. know, if, if I'm getting hit on a number of names, you know, I'm not going to probably start playing failure resets. You know, if this is, maybe this is the third or fourth stop that got hit in a row, you know, I'm going to be more timid. You know, if, if, I, if everything else is working and, um, and I'm seeing a lot of stocks that, you know, shake out and reset, you know, I might, I might be, uh, you know, getting back into this. It really depends on, on, you know, how I'm gauging the environment at the particular time. Very interesting. And, and you've said something a couple of times along the lines of you're paying attention to what's working and kind of shifting your focus to that type of setup. So it's interesting that if, if breakouts are working, you're looking at those pullbacks um, are working. You're looking at those. It's kind of uh, obvious, but uh, it's something that definitely people should be doing. Well, here's, and here's the danger of saying that I have to be very careful and be very, people take things very literally when yeah. I make these interviews that it does not mean you're changing your strategy. Mm -hmm. okay? That doesn't mean that I'm not buying from BCPs. It doesn't mean that all of a sudden I'm buying stocks that are down. It means, it means that I'm changing my tactic within the realm of my strategy. So that like, again, I'm selling a lot of stocks now that, just when they write, when they run up, oh, but I'm still buying from the exact same buy points. I just know that they're not following through as much. So I haven't changed my, my research or I haven't changed the way I do things. I just changed my expectation from the upside until I start seeing better upside because I, I can't be using stops for swing trades. If you're only getting short-term moves out of them and I keep getting stopped out, it's not paying for it. You always have to think, am I going to pay for this risk? You've got to pay for the risk, right? You've got, you flip that coin. You got to get $2 on heads. If you're going to risk a dollar on tails, or I mean, if you got a dollar 10, it'll still work, but you'd have to flip that coin a whole lot more times. So if you're a day trader, you can have a, a smaller ratio. Right. So you know, again, it all comes down to math. Absolutely. Um, and thanks for clarifying that. Um, looking at this chart, how long does that contraction have to be, that last contraction? Because it looks like this this is about two, two and a half weeks before it, it moves up um, through that prior high. Well, that was one of the problems is that this really wasn't a very long base. And it's kind of it, stubby, yeah. Yeah, it, well, it, it's it, this was more of a power play type situation. If right. you go back here from the top and you go back a couple months, eight weeks, and you measure from here to here, you're at 124%. So that that 
is a power play, what I call a power play. Uh, O'Neill would refer to these as high tight flags. You don't have a, it, this isn't a real powerful though, explosive power play. It sort of just kind of, you know, worked its way higher. And then you put in the short base. So these short bases I'll play on the power moves, but you didn't have that type of real explosion. Uh, so sometimes those get what I call wiggles. You know, you get some wiggles around the breakouts and it didn't really, really tighten up super tight. So, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't perfect, but it was good enough to play. Gotcha. And would you mind bringing up snap and, and maybe we can talk about a, a low cheat setup or I'm not, I'm, I'm not quite sure what setup you bought this off of last year. Let's um, see if there's, there's still the. Yeah. Okay. I, I love, I loved how tight it was within that base for, I think it was a three weeks tight within the base, which caught my eye after, after you posted about it on Twitter. Yeah. I, this, this that I have drawn on here was for my clients and not uh, for this particular presentation, but um, it's still here. So, so bought it here on nine fifteen as it started moving right through and you'll see it comes, it moves out, follows through the next day and then comes in one, two, three days, but as a good close on the third day, see that didn't come down enough to, to stop me out. It didn't come back to my stop. So it was still in it. Um, and then, I believe this is where I sold into earnings. So then it had the earnings report and I had a nice little cushion. See, it, it worked its way up. Uh, let's get the percentage tool out. So that looks like about, so going into earnings, you know, like a, maybe a 16, 17% cushion. So now you can go into earnings and, and, and uh, sell into earnings. So that stock went up, you know, into earnings, you know, about 50%. Um, so that, you know, that's a very classic. Now this was, if you look at the market, this was actually setting up during a correction. Yeah, yeah. So this was one of the very first. I'm not sure if it was the first, but I think it was the first, second, or third stock that I bought after going to cash. So coming back into the market, this was one of the very first stocks. Um, and, and again, I don't know if, let me see if, uh, bring up the NASDAQ if we can. What, what date was that? That was like September. September 15th or around there somewhere. Yeah, somewhere. I think it was, yeah, right there. I think it was around yeah, there. So see, look at the market here. So I'm buying it right here. See, the market had just come in on a correction here. But see that stock, see how that stock broke out. Here's what happened. That stock broke out. All right, let's go, let's look at this and then we'll go back to snap. So that stock broke out here. Then this little pullback in the, in the market, this next leg down in the market, all that did was just bring snap in, but not enough to hit the stop. Then when the market turned back up, snap broke out of its base. Let's bring snap back up. So see again, see how the stock was telling the story here, not the market. If you waited for the market, you'd be buying over here. You know, you'd be buying late. So see, it broke out here. Now, as the market came in, snap just came down for a few days, but it, as long as it holds your stop, that's fine. Now, if the market comes in, if they're holding your stop, then it's acting fine. Then when the market turned back up, snap came out and went back and went to new high ground. So it was leading, leading stocks lead. Absolutely. Uh, definitely a clear example of RS. Um, and uh, what are your thoughts on, on traders taking responsibility for their trading? I, I see some people buying stocks 50% off their lows um, and, and they get stopped out while it's still in a downtrend. What are your thoughts about people really focusing on themselves, studying their own trades and uh, kind of improving themselves and taking responsibility for what actually happens with their trading instead of blaming the algos or, or all of that? Well, I don't know. I mean, I don't know who else could be to blame. Trading is one person. You're making the trade. You're making the decision. So if uh, <laughs> this is about the purest business there is where it, that's why I got in it. There's no red tape. There's no prejudice. There's no uh, boss to, uh, to impress. And if you're good, you get rewarded. I mean, the, the, the results tell the, uh, the, the level of skill. If you're skillful at this, then it'll show up in the PL. Um, so, you know, again, personal responsibility, the algos, all this crap that we hear that it's, you know, it's, it's manipulated and this, that, you know, back, back when the 87 crash, it was program trading, you know, then it was, then the SOS bandits came in. Those were the algos of the day in the nineties. It was, they blamed the SOS bandits, you know, and then it's high frequency trading and now it's algos. It, it, this is nonsense. This is nonsense. All right. All those computers have to basically make the same exact maneuvers that a human would make. And I could tell you right now, I'll trade any algo or any computer out there any day. 
it's absurd to, to think that a computer is going to cause all these problems and out be able to outmaneuver uh, a skillful person. It's not, it's not going to happen. It's just that, um, yes, can, can, can they cause noise? Sure. And at certain times, they're great. Sometimes they'll, you know, people didn't mind, I guess, the, uh, uh, you know, these uh, algorithms or whatever, when uh, GME ran up, right? Then, then it's okay. Then everything's fine when you're on the profitable side of them. But then the market crashes and we have a flash crash. You know, we've got to, we've got to blame the computers. It's the computers. But the bull market goes up for three years. It grinds its way higher for three years and everybody makes millions and, that, and everything's okay until you have that one big down day. Absolutely. We always have to respect risk. Um, going back to this chart of SNAP, um, did, did you play a portion of this for a, a larger move, maybe sold half because we were just coming out of a correction? No, I don't remember exactly how I played this. That's why I'm going by these notes here that were here. Yeah. But, but again, no, but I tried to come back in it. I think right here, I, if, I, if I remember, I think I tried to come back on over because now it made a power play. Now it moved up. See, it's up over 100% has that little tight pivot. And then I got stopped out right here. Yeah. Well, actually, yeah, I'm pretty sure I bought it on 11.6 mm -hmm. and then got knocked out again. And then it, again, it was a reset, came back up and then, you know, now it's getting more sloppy as it gets later, you know, you, you'll get more and more sloppy as the stock gets more and more eyes on it, gets more right. followed. And then of course, you know, as it's getting more and more profitable, you're having the, the, the bigger players now are going to be profit taking and they're going to create, you know, that real volatility because they're moving the big size. Absolutely. But are you willing to, are you more willing to play a stock for a larger move when we're just coming, coming out of a correction and maybe use the, the 50 day rule if it's a, if, a, if, if it's a major bear market like we had uh, in March? So the time when you should be giving a stock, you should be giving a stock the benefit of the doubt and trying to play it for a larger move is coming out of a, out of a correction, out of a bear market or a correction. Spend the larger the correction, the more you should be thinking longer term because now you might be onto a key leader that's going to start that new cycle and make a multi-year run. And if the market goes into a bull market, you could have these leaders can go up three, four, five hundred percent, and in some cases, you know, many thousands of percent. So in that case, you know, you'd be using, you could use what, what you know, have to, you know, read about that, of course, is my 50-day or better rule, um, where, uh, uh, you know, you use the 50-day, once it catches up to your, to your stop, and then your break-even point, you switch over to a close below the 50. And uh, there's a stock just recently, I think it's, um, my memory serves me, I was just seeing it today, Boyd. So we took a look at, let's take a look at a weekly on Boyd. So look at Boyd. Boyd comes out of this bear market. You see how, look at this ride the 50 the whole way. Wow, wow. Not a single weekly close below the 50 through the entire move, right? So if you just said, hey, I'm just going to wait for a weekly close below the 50. And maybe, you know, if it if it's below it by a certain percentage, you don't want to wait until it's, you know, 50% below it if it crashes. But uh, within reason, um, you would you would stay with this with this whole move. And if you go back cycle after cycle, um, you'll find that there's a handful of leaders that do this, that will, will, will stay above that 50 for the whole move or a good portion of the move. Um, so yeah, investing in, in a bull market. Now, when later on, you know, if I was to buy it here now, and I seen it's held for all this time. Now I'm looking for it maybe to get extended from the 50 and to start running up and accelerating its rate of advance. And I use that to sell into because now you're getting a blow off a climax top, something like that. And you'd, you'd be selling at the strength there. Absolutely. And um, looking back on a trade, how do you determine whether something was a good trade versus a bad trade? Well, you can have a, first of all, you could have a good trade. You can make a perfect trade and get stopped. Right. And you can make a terrible decision and be, and make money. That's why you can't, the, the, the result can't justify the means. You have to have rules and a strategy. A good trade is a trade that you stuck to your rules and you, and you, you executed your strategy uh, uh, effectively. So that could mean losing. Um, so that's the, see, that's the problem with the market. You, there's periods where, you know, you might do things that are really uh, not very prudent and not uh, and have no strategy at all and just get lucky and just be in the right place at the right time. And next thing you know, you think that's the way to do it. And meanwhile, you're you're, you're like a turkey being fattened up for the kill. So, you know, it, it's really important that you have rules. And when you go back and you analyze what you did and you're doing post analysis, you're not being biased by the outcome. You don't want to be outcome biased. You want to be 
discipline bias? Do you want to be strategy bias? Did I follow my discipline? Did I, did I follow the rules? Okay. Take a look at that. How's that working? And then, and then reassess, but don't say, oh, well, the stock went up. So I made a good decision. Not necessarily. And how important is it for traders to keep track of their summary statistics, the batting average, average gain, average loss, um, average holding period for losers and an average holding period for winners this is something that Dr. Wish really emphasized in the course that I took. Uh, how, how important is that? So how important are the numbers, the average gain, average loss, batting average? So for, for me, I think it's the, the utmost importance. I mean, to, I look at it this way. How do you know where to set your stop? If you don't know what you're, you know, if, how would you know where to set the loss on tails on that coin that I talked about flipping, if you don't know what you're going to gain on heads and you don't know how many times it's going to fall on heads, what if it's going to fall on heads one out of 10 times and you're only going to make a dollar 10 on heads. So can you still lose a dollar on tails, you know, or can it, so again, you know, you have to, how you have to know what your outcome or potential outcome is, at least to a point where you have a realistic expectation. You know, to me, it's like flying a plane without an instrument panel. Uh, so the, the important thing is to not only know your numbers in hindsight to see what you did, but then forward to when you make a decision trading, that thinking, the spreadsheet makes its way into your trading. So now as you're, you're making a trade, you're cognizant of what you need to achieve mathematically. And that starts to work into where you set your stops and you're thinking, you know, in terms of risk reward relationship, how would you be able to do that if you didn't know that information? And that's how you kind of determine whether you're a singles, doubles, triples, or a home run hitter. You, you, you look at those numbers, the average gain, average loss. And then from those numbers, you decide where to take your profits on average. And of course, when to cut your losses. Yes. And if your average gain is say 10%, you go back and you take a look at your last you know, hundred trades, 200 trades, and your average gain has been 10%. You know, you're right. You know, 48% of the time wrong. 52% of the time, your average gain is 10%. Well, if you have a stock that's up 20%, you're, two, you're double your average gain. If you sell that stock, what does that do to your average gain? It boosts it. It improves it, right? Yeah. So you know right there, you're improving, right? If it's at 5% and your average gain is 10, you have to think to yourself, well, that's not even at my average, right? That's probably not a time to be selling it unless something's going wrong. And then you look at your loss. Let's say your average loss is 5%. Well, if you're taking... 5% gains, 10% losses, are you, are you going to, is, is that profitable to take 5%, you know? So now, you know, that's really not a spot that you should be looking to sell unless right. something's wrong. If something's wrong, yes, that's a different story. But so, you know, again, letting the math work its way into your trading. And that's really the key. It's not just knowing, okay, this is what I did. Okay. Well, now what are you going to do with that information? Now you could, that information is very valuable to, 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 for your mindset as you're actually placing trades. Absolutely. And, and to bring up a great question that uh, somebody posted on Twitter, I, I asked for questions. I thought this was excellent. Um, how do you mentally come back from a, a, a gap down, a, a large loss, larger than your average loss, or, or even a period where you're not trading well? How do you mentally reset, do what you need to do, follow your rules and, and prepare for, for the next trade and, and get back on your feet? Well, I, you know, I know this is going to sound maybe crazy to some people, but I very, I almost never get in that situation, to be honest with you. I very seldom get myself into big trouble. And that's because I'm really very prudently using progressive exposure, um, never really, you know, opening my nose up and putting myself at big risk without really being covered. You know, they, in poker, they say, always give yourself outs. Um, now, it doesn't mean that I don't get torpedoed every now and then. Yes, that does happen. That does happen. Uh, if it does happen, there, there's there's not much you can do about it, right? I mean, if if the stock you know gaps down on you and it gets through your stop, you know you've got to you've got to cut the bleeding. You know you don't know how bad it's going to get. You know, sometimes the stock gaps down. You know your stop is five percent, it gaps down fifteen percent. You sell it, turns around, rallies all the way back, and it turns out if you held it, you wouldn't have lost any money or maybe made money. Well, that doesn't mean that you should not cut your loss next time. 
first of all, those are, those are what we call the tails and the distribution curve. Those are the tails. Those are outliers, all right? They, they're not going to happen that often. All right. It's going to be, it, it shouldn't be unless you're putting yourself in, again, you're putting yourself into downtrends and stocks that, you know, yeah, then you're going to have, uh, um, you're going to be buying what David Ryan calls serial gappers. You know, these are stocks that will, you'll get unhappy surprises because you're in a downtrend. So if you, if you're doing all the proper work, these are going to be very rare. And in the long run, they're not going to really make much of a difference. I know they're not going to make any difference. If I'm, if I do 200 trades, 500 trades, a thousand trades, and I've got two or three outliers, they're not really going to make a big difference unless I have my entire account fully leveraged into one stock. And I would never, you know, I would never do that holding overnight and putting myself in a position where I had gap risk. Perfect. And, and last question when it comes to charts, and I think this is something that um, I personally struggle with, and a lot of people do. Um, it, it's kind of knowing when to sell into strength. Is it completely a mathematical thing when imp- it's going to improve your um, your average gain? That's when you do it, or is it a feel thing? It, it's market dependent. W- what kind of are the factors in play there? Well, they're all the factors above that you said, but the the, the situation is is that look, there's a whole selling section in my in my most recent. Yeah stock book and think and trade like a champion. There's a whole selling section and it be take quite a bit to go through all that and look at all those sell rules, but there's a, there's sell rules uh, for selling at the strength and selling into weakness. Uh, but when the stock has an accelerated rate of advance and it becomes unsustainable, it doesn't mean that you don't sell the stock and it goes up much more from there. See, you have to realize what trading is about. It's not getting the high and getting the low. It's about making more than you risk and being able to do it over and over enough times within a given period of time to reach your goal. That's what trading is about. It has nothing to do with hindsight of what happens after you trade. The key is what happens during the trade. What happened before and what happened after is not relevant to your profitability. All right. It may be re- relevant to your analysis of when you're going to get in the stock or maybe improve your decision making later on by looking at your post analysis of what happened. But it doesn't make it doesn't make a hill of a beans difference uh, of, to your profitability. Your profitability is in between the buy point and the sell point. And if the stock has gone up ten thousand percent, and then you buy it and it goes up ten more percent, and you sell it, that's all that matters. You made that amount right. And if and if it, if it uh, you know if it's uh, not done that and it's gone up five percent, and then you make a hundred percent neither really makes a difference. It matters of what you make in between the buy and the sell. So, uh, um, you know, again, I don't know, I, I got away probably from your question, uh, but uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of different sell rules. Um, like I said before, the general rule of thumb is that if you're on a shorter term trade, you're looking to sort of get, you know, get out when the getting's good, right? Sell into strength because you can't really let the stock come back on you because it's going to give up too much and you're going to give back all your profit because you're going to keep your stops very tight on those short-term trades. If you're going for a bigger move, well, then you can allow more room and maybe use uh, backstops and uh, allow uh, allow yourself to sell stocks uh, uh, into downside sell rules. That's sort of the general you know rule of thumb. But I would refer to my my book on sell rules, and O'Neill's book too has a lot of great sell rules. Some of ours are going to be the same too because you know I'm using uh, some of the same sell rules and some permutations of those sell rules. All right, Mark, that, that's awesome. Uh, I always like to, to end it with one more um, kind of question. Uh, what kind of motivating words do you have for new traders who maybe are getting chopped up a bit in 2021? And what can new traders do to shorten the learning curve? Well, the good news is, is that it's a great time to be a stock trader. It's a great time to be anything. A, and the reason why is because the learning curve is automatically shortened because you have, you have things like this right here. Right. We have YouTube, we have the internet, we have uh, Zoom, and we have all kinds of uh, Twitter and all this exchange of information that when I started, there was nothing. I was going to the library and I was reading books that were old and outdated and from strategies and techniques that never worked in the first place. So it took me years and years and years of trial and error and trial and error to figure it all out. But now your learning curve has been shortened tremendously. But, but here's the main thing you have to remember. It can be shortened only so much. Right. You, you can't force experience. And there's a certain amount of experience. It, Michael Jordan can tell you how to dribble and toss a basketball, but 
you're not going to be able to be a professional basketball player without playing and being in those situations and having a certain amount of experience on the court and in big games. Um, so it's the same thing. You, you know, you still have to have a certain amount of experience. So my words would be to, to make sure that you understand that it's going to take time and make a commitment to it and, and do what you love. You know, that's the main thing. If you enjoy it, then stick with it and you'll get great at it. But there's all the information's there. We have information overload now. There's too much information. It used to be you couldn't find any information. Now you got to figure out what is the good information and what's the bullshit. That's the, that's the big problem now is narrowing it down to the good information. But right. that's a better problem to have, I think, than no information. So it's a great time to be a stock trader. It's a great time to be anything. You could learn how to... Yeah, I'm a musician. I've been a musician my whole life. When we first, you know, when I first started playing and I was learning songs, I had to take the album and I had to put the needle back and listen to it and take, take the album, put the needle back and try to play it. Now, the person who played that part and wrote that part is on YouTube teaching you how to do it. Right. That's why you've got these, you got seven-year-olds playing a song, you know, playing the guitar uh, incredibly. And, you know, these incredible, they look like they're protege, you know, gifted, uh, uh, um, you know, musicians when in fact, no, just the information now in, in the learning curve has been cut way down because our teaching is so much better. We're, we're accessing the whole world and we're accessing talent from around the world. So this very thing that we're doing right now is the reason why you should be very excited and very motivated for the future. Awesome, Mark. Th thanks so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Um, thanks for coming on. You're, you're welcome back anytime. Uh, for everybody watching, thanks for tuning in. If you enjoyed, please go ahead and leave a like down below and subscribe. If you want to see more great interviews, like with great traders and market wizards like Mark Minervini, and I'll see you guys in future videos.